Well, hello, my name is Mark Barguer, and I am here today hosting a webinar with uh, three of my colleagues, Peter Torrey, George Beardsley, and Mary Keenan. I'd like to welcome them to the screen as well and welcome you to this conversation. On our webinar today, I know some of you are probably uh, really excited about talking about uh, church administration and some of those functions, but I'll remind you, it is a spiritual gift listed in the Bible, and also, it's one of those things I remember they didn't teach me much about in seminary, so we're hoping today's session, where many of you pastors and some of the executive pastors and uh, all, all you folks watching, will get some, get some good information and uh, some resources through Transformation Ministries, not only in this time, but afterwards in our conversations, because we're all open to talk to you. Um, the conversation, just to make sure you're in the classroom, the right classroom today, uh, used to do this at Azusa Pacific when I, when I taught to make sure everybody was in the right place. How to keep your church, your board, and your pastor out of court, those are good ideas, and your church running smoothly. And for any of you that have ever been in a church where there's been a, uh, a lawsuit against the entire church, or any of those kind of things that have happened, you realize this is a topic that needs to be talked about. It's uncomfortable when you're in the middle of it, but there are ways of avoiding some of those things by uh, planning, by having uh, administrative and liability discussions with board and people and uh, in all your ministries. So today's gonna be a kind of a how-to and a not-to webinar. We'll cover some of the questions that our church health team gets on a regular basis from many of our churches. And we thought this would be helpful to each of you watching today. So uh, without further ado, I just wanna remind us that uh, there is a chat feature here on the screen, which we can all talk to each other and you can pull that down and talk to one another. And in the Q and A section, you can also ask questions. So today's conversation, will have a lot of questions that we ask. You may have another one you want to have answered. Please enter that anytime during the presentation. We'll try and make sure that we answer that on the screen today as we go. So we've kind of lined this up. I'll give you the idea. We're going to talk about security first with Peter Torrey, then a little bit about finance with Mary Keenan. I'll give you a little of their backgrounds before we start too, why we've, I've chosen them. And then George Beardsley will finish us with human resources. And if we have time, we'll, we'll uh, discuss the exciting topic of some of the liabilities uh, that need to be avoided in churches today and some ways to do that um, inside your church and we'll all participate in that discussion. So let's go ahead and get started. Peter Torrey uh, is going to get us started talking about security audits and some of you may even say why would I even want a security audit? How often should I do one? What does it really do for me? And Peter is uh, the retired executive pastor from Purpose Church and so glad to have him here with us today. Peter, Take it away. Okay, thank, thank you, Mark. Um, it's been my privilege to do a number of security audits for a number of TM churches. Uh, this is one of those things that 10 years ago you hardly ever thought about, but with the increase of uh, violence in church situations and so forth, safety and security keeps coming up to the top in terms of concerns and so mm -hmm. forth. And so we want to do security audits. We want to review uh, a number of things. I actually have a list of about 26 different things that I want to look at in a, in a security audit or a safety and security audit because we cover safety issues as well as security. And we go through and the form of the review or the audit is simply that I'll come out to a church, spend a couple of hours with a staff person, somebody else that's got keys to every room in the church. And we go through and take a good long look at where are your exposures? Where are some safety issues for you? Where are some security issues for you? And how can they be fixed? We talk about other things like uh, how, do you, how do you evacuate in an emergency? Uh, a lot of churches, you know, they don't really have an evacuation plan and everybody says, well, the door is right there. That's how I'm going out. But if there are first responders trying to come in the same door that everybody is trying to go out, you can have a problem. So you got to think about things like evacuation. We do that, talk through that with staff. And then I come back and I'll make a report to the, to the church. Now, 
one of the concerns that I often hear about a security review or audit is that, well, if we have this done, there may be some things that we've got to do and it's gonna cost us a lot of money to change things or to do this or to fix that. And occasionally that is the case. There is something that needs to be dealt with and, it, and it's an expensive issue. But usually, the fixes that most churches need to do as a result of a security audit are relatively simple, relatively easy, and, and usually not terribly expensive. Let me give you an, an illustration and a tip that all of you can use to make your children's area safer right now. You don't need to do a security review to do this. Um, you can do it during COVID restrictions because you would probably only one or two of you be in a room. But go to the room where you have the children that, are the, that you use for children that are five and under, age five and under. Get in the room, assume that it's, uh, we assume that it's all set up the way it would be on a Sunday and do this. Get down on your hands and knees and crawl around the room and look and see, what do you see? Because what you see when you're on your hands and knees is what the, the three-year-old or the four-year-old or the two-year-old mm -hmm. sees when they're walking around that room. And when I do this, inevitably I find some things, little things that will make that room safer. I've done it in a church and I looked around and all of the electric outlets had little plug, you know, those plug covers on them except for two. Somebody had plugged something in, taken the cover off, never replaced it. And a child could come up, stick something in there and, and get an electric shock. Now that fix is really simple and really cheap. Uh, there was another time I did it and underneath the table, there were some cords hanging down that were attached to a TV monitor. And if you were an adult in that room, you couldn't see the cords because they were behind and under the, the table. But a child, a three-year-old child could see that cord and my goodness, that could be a tr an attractive thing to pull on. And it's a real simple thing to either attach those cords to the wall or do something else so that the children can't get hold of them and pull them. So those are the kinds of things that we, that we look for. The little things in most cases that you can do to make your, your church safer. And we're, we're happy to do it. Um, uh, you know, it, it's, it's a simple process and it just takes a couple of hours of time for me to be able to come down, be with your staff, and then another uh, hour or two to come back with a report and uh, help guide you th through that. So we're happy to do it. If you're interested, you can either email me at ptory at outlook.com or email Mark and we'll get back to you and arrange, uh, arrange a time. So that's, that's what the uh, security audit is about. And I think it's one of those things that, like I said, 10 years ago, you never thought about, but now mm -hmm. it's an important thing. Mark? Well, thanks, Peter, for that overview. You know, uh, part of our StratOps process that we do in many churches, I get to play uh, the role of doing a secret shopper. And we have about 50 things we go on and it's very similar to what you just mentioned. We just try and point out things. I remember one church, I went in a hallway upstairs across from the children's room, had a, a huge knife set out. It was on this like uh, these big, you know, silver trays uh, that, you know, it's just kind of for display and it looks cool. But if I was a young person, I had access to that at any time. Also, some of the windows in another church I was at were broken. And again, it was no big deal to adults, but to kids, they could actually put their hands in there, could get hurt. And then I also have a lot of fun with this. I dress up either as a homeless person or the Unabomber is the one I just did at Temple City a couple of weeks ago, <laughs> just to see what I can get away with. I try to steal kids, not, come on now, I'm not really trying to steal them, but I'm trying to see if I can penetrate all of the systems, all the structures, all the safety, all the security measures and get in and take things, take people. And, uh, you know, one church, the guy came up and, and confronted me. And I was very proud of him because I wrote it in the report. I said, this guy told me in no uncertain terms, get out. This is, you're not authorized in here. I said, that's the right thing to do. Um, yeah. So all of that is so important for our churches today. So um, 
Peter, a couple of questions along that line. What types of warning signs should we post around our ministry? Kind of, kind of going along that topic. Is there any warning signs we should put outside? Well, it's an interesting question. It kind of depends on a lot of your philosophy and what you want to say and communicate to people. Yes. Obviously, there are safety things that that you want to be aware of, and if there's anything, um, you know. Uh, steps that could be dangerous, uh, things like that, you want to have some kinds of signs so that uh, from a safety standpoint, uh, people don't miss a step or th that sort of thing. And, and um, some of those things, if you're building a new place, uh, the zoning and the codes will take care of that for you. They'll tell you what you have to have and where. Uh, but older facilities sometimes don't have some of those those kinds of things. So you, you want that. You also want to make sure that things like fire extinguishers, uh, um, automated external defibrillators are well identified and uh, some of those kinds of things. Um, I was in one church doing a, a security review and I asked them if they had a, a uh, automated external defibrillator and they said, yeah. And I said, where is it? And nobody knew. <laughs> well, there's a little problem there, folks. I, <laughs> you know, how are you going to find it in an emergency if nobody knows? So having some of the right signage and hmm. those kinds of things um, are important. And I think uh, that's, you know, that's, those are the kinds of things that you want, you want to do. Um, and sometimes when I do the review, I'll see some of the signage that is either there or missing. Uh, there's some exit signs or some other things that that just are missing, and and they they need to they're simple to put up, but they need to be there to help people. Those are good ideas, Peter. Thank you for that. And another common question I get uh, from all sides of churches is. Uh, should our church have armed security guards like during the services or during certain events or uh, what, 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 what would your response to that be? Well, the, the, uh, the response to a lot of questions is depends, but <laughs> we don't want, we, we won't leave it just there. Um, yeah. And part of the, that question is, has to do too with what do you mean by an armed security guard? Um, a lot of churches, I know at Purpose Church, we have uh, some retired police officers who carry, who are armed. Uh, it's a concealed weapon. They, they, and uh, the uniform is simply a shirt that has security on it because we don't want to make a big deal out of it. Uh, some people, if they see somebody in a uniform, they think, oh, this place must be dangerous because every, they've got these, these uh, uh, uniformed people around. Other places may say, oh, they're keeping us safe because they've got uniformed people. So our, our answer to that at Purpose Church was for them to have uh, you know, a, a shirt that all of the security team has the same kind of shirt with security on it so that they're easily identifiable, but it's not like you've got armed police walking around. What most churches need to be aware of is that they may have people in their congregation that are carrying concealed weapons, even, even if they aren't um, authorized by the church to do it. And if you do have people on your security team who are carrying um, they need to know each other. And if a church becomes aware that there are other people that are carrying weapons and they are not part of the authorized security team, somebody needs to have a conversation with them because if they pull out their weapon in some kind of an active shooter kind of a situation, they need to be prepared to be shot at because nobody may know who they are and suddenly they pull out a weapon. So, mm. It, it's wise to have something that indicates who your security is, but it doesn't have to be screaming at people that, hey, we've got this armed security uh, group. 
That's helpful, Peter. Thank you for getting some general guidelines out there. I know there's a lot more to that. And uh, there's systems and structures and ways of doing that. But let me ask another common question I have, because I've been to a lot of board meetings uh, and a lot of church services. Are ministries allowed to remove disruptive people? And if so, how, how would they do that? Uh, the, the answer to the first part of the question is yes. Uh, a lot of people who are disruptive will claim that the church is public property and they can't be removed, but that is not true. The church is private property. It's owned privately and people can be removed. Um, hmm. Now, the question of how to do that is a different question, and, and some of that depends on the capabilities of your safety and security team. Hmm. Assuming that you have some people on the safety and security team that are maybe either retired or off-duty officers, uh, they can handle some of those kinds of things in a different way than somebody that's, that's not trained to handle some of those things. One of the most important things in that conversation is how do you verbally de-escalate situations? Mm. There are some people who just automatically escalate. And if, if your uh, safety and security people, your ushers and so forth are trained to de-escalate verbally, that can go a long way to solving the problem of disruptive people. A good point. And I, what I like to do is if there's somebody that's disruptive um, and it's in the middle of a service, you send somebody, seat them next to them and try to de-escalate de right there without having to make a scene. They just sit down, just quietly mm -hmm. whisper to them, hey, can we talk about things later? And, you know, things like that. Um, and then afterwards, you can have a more serious, lengthy conversation about whether or not that person can come back to church if they're going to behave that way. Mm -hmm. you, you, if, if at all possible, you don't want to make a scene worse during a service. You want to do it later. And one of the keys to it, there's a lot more that goes into it, but verbally de-escalate is, is one of the keys. And if you can get that happening, you're going you're gonna to come out way ahead. And I've I remember we had one person who thought he was Moses <laughs> and, and uh, he was speaking out during the service and so forth and, and we were able to kind of calm him down and he left. A few weeks later he came back and he was going to, he wanted to sit in the service and so forth and, and some of our people saw him and so forth and we got him near the back of the worship center before the service started. And I simply said to him, are, are you going to behave this way or this time the way you did the last time? He said, I didn't do anything wrong the last time. And that at that point, I made my decision that he wasn't coming into the service because simply because mm -hmm. I knew he didn't, he didn't recognize that what he was doing was inappropriate. Yeah. Uh, but we were able to solve that before the service. And the previous time we'd been able to quiet him down so it wasn't a major disruption to the service but we knew where that could go if we didn't deal with it properly. Great ideas, Peter. Just some of them seem like such common sense, but they also need to be known commonly among the whole congregation, among the leadership and, yeah. and directed. So uh, I was gonna ask a question, what if the disruptive person is the pastor? What do we do with that? But that's a whole other topic and we're not gonna cover that today. One of, um, the, one of the funny stories that I've heard <laughs> is, a, is that there was a, a guy who, came into a church one time and he, he had a weapon with him. He had it in his pocket and he went and sat down right up at the front because he was going to protect the pastor. Yeah. But what happened, his safe, the safety was off on his gun. And when he sat down, he shot himself in the leg. <laughs> oh, <my goodness. laughs> of course, the security people just, you know, just <laughs> went after him. And yeah. Like, doing because he was a he was somebody that was known in the church and he's one yeah. protecting the pastor yeah, yeah. well why did he think the pastor needed protection <laughs> yeah. <laughs> yeah sometimes we're protecting ourselves from ourselves yeah um, i just would like to thank you peter for all those topics on security and helpful ideas we're going to move on but if any of you have questions 
uh, for Peter about other security topics, feel free in the Q&A right now to just put those there. Peter will answer some of those uh, by typing and some of those we can bring those back at the end of today's session, we'll talk some more. So thank you, Peter, appreciate you. And uh, I'd like to move on to Mary Keenan. Mary is uh, working down at the Beach Point Church, not officially, I don't think, but she does a lot of things down there. She's been on our team with Church Health now for a couple of years, helping in the area of trust and uh, helping set up some of those things for people and some of those seminars that we've done along with our, uh, uh, our folks there at Lifestyle Giving. But Mary also has uh, done some internal control reviews. So maybe as she talks about financial topics, maybe Mary, you could kind of answer that question. What's an internal control review? Why as a church would I ever want to have one done? And how often should I do them? Maybe you can start us there. Sure, sure. Thanks, Mark. Um, you know, an internal control review is an assessment of uh, the, the financial and internal, internal controls of a church. So what happens with this internal control? And, and usually this kind of uh, agreed upon procedure is tailor made for the church, meaning that uh, you come in and have a conversation to uh, with the church to find out exactly what they want to find out with this internal control. And so it's usually starts off with the church answering uh, a list of written questions about the financial policies and the procedures that take place, um, that are currently taking place at the church. Um, questions would involve, um, are there any written policies and procedures for finances? Um, you, you have a chart of accounts. Do you um, have monthly financial statements that are generated? Um, for cash receipts, you know, what are your deposit um, procedures um, when you deposit funds? When you're counting offerings, do you have a counting team? How how does that accounting how does that counting team operate? Um, are there segregations of duties when it comes to cash receipts that come in and the disbursements? You know, is there a separation of duty with um, authorization? Uh, record keeping, and then the custody of the assets. That's an, an extremely important, that is just the primary reason to have an, an internal controls is because it's the separation of duties. It really would reduce the number of errors. It prevents fraud. Uh, there's just uh, a myriad of good things that happen when you have that segregation of duties. Um, you know, what are your uh, payment procedures and your authorization to pay expenses? Um, how are those payments issued? Um, you know, bank reconciliations, are those done, you know, um, uh, routinely? Are they done routinely? And are they reviewed by someone other than the person who prepares that bank statement? Uh, what are your payroll procedures? Do you do it in-house? Do you have a payroll service? What are those procedures? Um, how do you record fixed assets? There are a lot of churches that don't record fixed assets. Essentially, they kind of have a profit and loss with a bank account. So do you record those fixed assets and how do you do it? Do you have depreciation of those assets? Um, we also take a look at personnel files. What do those personnel files house? Do you have sensitive information in there? What kind of information do you have in there? And then financial statement presentation. How are you recording all of this activity and presenting it to the board? So we, it's probably about a 10 or 15 page questionnaire that's answered. Then once we get that questionnaire back, we review it and um, based upon the answers, there are some people that uh, are in the finance area, either employees or volunteers, and we'll come in and actually do an interview with them. We'll say, okay, this is how these questions were answered. Is this, is, is this what's happening? We'll take that information from all these interviews and then we will prepare um, procedures to do. Like we'll test some transactions. If they say every single expense is authorized, we will do some random uh, testing of those expenses and see if there is an authorization signature. Um, we'll inspect documents that they say, yes, our, our Personnel files have this and this and this and this. Okay, let's take a look at the personnel file. Do you have mm. all those items that you've said? And then once we've done all of that, we've done the questionnaire, we've 
done the interview with the, the staff and the volunteers there, and we have done the test of transactions, we prepare a report for the board. And in that report, we say, okay, this is, this is what's happening. This is, here are the questions we asked, here are the answers, here are our findings. This is the testing we did. Here's our findings. And then we give them recommendations for improvement. If we find there are things that are lacking, we give them recommendations for improvement. And then we also give them um, guidelines for how they might implement those recommendations. And if need be, um, uh, you know, I've got, I've appeared before the board and given the presentation before the board, and then they were there to ask questions. So it is a, it's, it's a, it's a really good function to have for a church. Um, I've especially seen it done when there's been a change of pastors and they want to come in and just make sure that there's, you know, some tight internal controls. We've had this oversight. Um, sometimes when new boards come on, they will have this um, internal control review done. I've seen churches do them every two years, some every five years, some have never had them done. <laughs> so it's kind of over the map, but uh, that's essentially what an internal control review is. So well, thank you, Mary. That's very helpful. I think uh, a lot of those controls are set up not only to protect the church, but my, uh, also I've noticed they're also to protect people yes. that they don't have temptations uh, mm -hmm. put in front of them that are not double checked. If they know that's in place, that protects the people as well from somebody either implementing them or from them being enticed uh, into doing something. So those are really important controls. Tell us how, how is an internal control review different than an audit um, from your experience, Mary? Well, an audit is, is performed by a, a CPA and it's the highest level of service that you could have. It's a financial statement audit. And, um, you know, within the audit, there is a, an assessment of internal control. So doing this internal control review is part of an audit. And um, they do the test of transactions. There's a lot of compliance um, behind the scenes type paperwork that has to go on with an audit. You would get a financial statement prepared by the CPA that may look very different than the financial statement that you do in-house for management purposes. Mm -hmm. um, audits typically are pretty expensive just because of all the time and all the energy and all the documentation that has to go on. Um, typically churches only do audits when they are um, need one for the bank or for ECFA, for um, they're buying property, whatever, you know, mostly when they have a loan, that's when they would need an audit, um, uh, you know, a higher level loan. Some, some banks only require compilations or review, but the audit is the highest level of service and most expensive by, by far. That's good to know. I know the, the ICR that you were talking about, the internal control report and review is much less expensive and has huge value for our churches. So maybe those are done a little more often to make sure all those things are in play and uh, procedures to really protect individuals and the church. Mm -hmm. So, but if I was uh, at a church and I wanted to, to hire a, uh, an auditor or a, a, an independent contractor for tax purposes, well, how might I go about identifying how to do that? I know in my mind, if I'm at a small church, I want the guy with the best price, but that's not always the best way to uh, search for uh, that kind of expertise. Uh, yeah, so, you know, the state of California, um, they have uh, adopted this uh, ABC test to determine how to the, uh, determine if the person is an independent contractor. Most of the people that you hire are employees. So it's, it's, uh, they've, they've made it really tight. It used to be that a lot of people would come in and they would really be employees, but you type them as an independent contractor to save on payroll taxes and things like that. But um, in January of 2020, the state of California just really tightened it. And there's three things. So the ABC test to determine if that person is an independent contractor is number one, the person, the worker is free from the company's control. 
So they're coming in and they're just doing work. They're not under the control of the company whatsoever. They set their own hours. They have their own requirements. Um, they may not even come into the, to the office there. They're not managed by the church. So they're, they're definitely um, out from under control. Uh, second thing is the B is that it, the job itself has to fall outside the normal course of business that a church is in. So you can't, you know, hire a part-time pastor or part-time, you know, youth pastor or something like that and say they're an independent contractor. The church is in the business of pastoring and, uh, you know, spreading the gospel. And so that's part of their core work. So that person could not be an independent contractor. They would be an employee. And then the third one is, is the worker typically operates a separate business from the company. So to talk about, um, say a CPA, we talked about this earlier, a CPA comes in to do a financial statement review. Well, the church is not in the business of CPA work. So this person comes in, does a job just for a specific purpose. They do this work for other companies and churches and things like that. So they're absolutely have a separate business. So it's those three things that you have to remember. The worker's free from the company's control. The type of work is outside the usual business of the church. And the worker is in business for themselves. So they're not employed by the church. Those are the three factors that would indicate the person could be a independent contractor. Great. Thanks for identifying that as well, uh, Mary. That's been an important question and some changes to inside of our churches to comply with current tax law is really important. That one seems to come up. The other one that I hear a lot is what are the potential ramifications for leasing ministry parking lots to outside entities? This even comes up sometimes for uh, if I have a lot of income because I've rented my property <laughs> to multiple different organizations, some Christian, some non-Christian, um, what are the tax ramifications of all that revenue? It almost looks like the church is for profit in some views. So can you help us with that at all? Uh, yeah. So uh, oftentimes when you're leasing out to um, non-ministry related um, businesses, say, you know, like a parking lot, say you're, say you're leasing out a parking lot, that could be subject to what's called UBIT, Unrelated Business tax Income Tax. I always call it, mm. I like it UBTI, but it's UBIT. So, <laughs> so it, it, it could be. So if, if, you're, um, if you're leasing out this property to another business, they're coming in and they're just using the parking lot and it's, you're, you're just collecting rent and it's acting like a trader business, not like a ministry. Um, and that trade or business, so you're, you're doing that regularly. You're, you're leasing out this parking lot to a non-related business. It doesn't further the, the uh, mission of the church. It's just a separate business. Then that would constitute a trade or business activity, which would make it subject to that unrelated business income tax. Okay. So my little line here is you can get bit by UBIT if you don't do it correctly. Is that right? <laughs> yes. Did I get that acronym down? Okay. Yes, so that's something did. to be careful of. <laughs> Thanks, Mary. Hey, one last question, if I can, then we're going to move on. But a lot of ministry leaders uh, like to know how to deal with donor-directed <laughs> donations. <laughs> how, how should ministry leaders really deal with that? Well, it... it I mean, there's, there's several things you can do. A lot of times there'll be a donor designated um, uh, contribution to something like a building fund. So the church is it's like, you know, we're, we're accepting donations um, to this building fund. So you accept the donation. It's furthering the mission of the church. And so it, it's a tax deductible gift. That's, mm. that's all fine. You just, it's, it's, um, the donor directs it, but the church is in control of it. So that's what's really important because there's oftentimes maybe uh, somebody will want to give a, de a designated gift for something that maybe is not part of the church's mission. Maybe they're like, I want to give money for a flagpole. 
well, it's not under the, the church doesn't really want a flagpole or anything like that. And so the, the thing is, is they would have to either say, no, we're not going to take that designated because it's not something we have planned for the church. Or if they'll say, we'll, we'll take your um, suggestion, but the church really, the church really can, they have to have control over the money before that person can get a tax deductible donation receipt. Okay. And I think I said that right, right? T tax deduction. So I think the same thing happens when um, people give a designated gift going to an individual. This is, this is what's really, you got to be really careful here because maybe they are giving it to an individual because um, they're going on a, on a mission trip. The church doesn't pay for it all. Somebody wants to come in and say, hey, they're going on this mission, ship, mission trip. I want to help with that. And they give a donor designated for that particular individual. Because what they're doing with the money is furthering the mission of the church, that makes it okay. So you just got to make sure that when you're giving a donor designated and it's going to an in individual, there is no inurement. So there's no benefit to this individual. You can't use the church as kind of a flow through to get money to another person. You know, they talk about um, maybe uh, a person's son is a pastor at a church. Well, I want to give money to the son, but they want to donate, they want to get a tax deduction. So they kind of do it through the church. Well, that's enormous. It's benefiting that individual. Yeah. Outside the lines on that one, for sure. Mm -hmm. yeah. mm -hmm. Good. All right. Well, Mary, thank you for uh, answering a few questions on finance. We're going to move on. Again, uh, Mary's on the church health team available at Beach Point if you have some questions. Uh, mm -hmm. Uh, and uh, we would be glad to help you with that. Let's move on, if we could, to George Beardsley. I know he's anxious to get talking about the Dodgers. No, I mean, human resources. Um, got that mixed up. Sorry uh, there, George. But I um, wanted to give him a chance to talk a little about the importance of human resources and uh, what, what we might uh, do in some of those areas to make sure that we um, protect the church and keep ourselves uh, out of court. Maybe you can help us with that, George. Thanks, Mark. I really do appreciate the opportunity and be a part of to be a part of this panel that talks about the riveting concepts like uh, legal, I mean, security, uh, financial and HR. It's incredible. Absolutely. And Mark, thanks for opening the door, because I do want to talk about tonight and Clayton Kershaw taking the mound for the Dodgers. Um, <laughs> you bet. Well, and, and, and seriously, I do. You know, most people don't realize there's a pretty hefty contract put together that uh, would sign Clayton Kershaw to play for the Dodgers. And most fans would never look at that contract and realize there's all kinds of things that he is not supposed to do. He's not supposed to ride a motorcycle. He's not supposed to go parachuting or skiing or anything because he's supposed to show up tonight and throw the ball and help the Dodgers win a World Series um, ring. And he would love to get his yep. first. And I yeah. say that because all the fans that are watching the game, they came to watch baseball. They don't really care that he doesn't ride a motorcycle or doesn't snow ski. And a lot of the stuff we're talking about is in that same vein. Our congregation wants to show up and be in a service where they worship the Lord together, their children are safe, that, that they are financially above reproach. But we have to have those behind the scenes scene things in our, you know, so in our social contracts with our congregation that they recognize that our facilities are secure, like Peter did such a great job saying, and financially above board, like Mary did a great job walking us through so that we can show up on the weekend and um, enjoy the fellowship of other believers and proclaim the word of God, because that's what we do. And if we can do that such that pe people never knew Peter was there or Mary was there or George was there, um, we've, we've done our jobs because it's usually when our jobs didn't get done that all of a sudden we ended up in court or in a newspaper and man, we do not want to see that. So when it comes to HR and even sitting in the executive pastor seat, Mark, man, to shepherd our staff team, to love them and free them to do the ministry that God has called them to do, that is my goal and my passion. The, the details of some of the things we're going to talk about, those are just necessary things so that we can play the game God's called us to play. So looking forward to the game tonight, but also privileged to serve our staff team and even handle those interesting issues like HR, Mark. 
You know, so important. And uh, I always refer back to a book I read called Winning on Purpose by John Kaiser. It had so much to do that actually in winning in ministry has to do with being intentional and purposeful. And human resources is part of that. And you're right. When we're behind the scenes and do the things right, then ministry can happen out on the mound, so to speak, uh, in, uh, to, to really uh, support all that we want to do to be about the Great Commission. And that's what we're here for. So, uh, but let's talk about some of the little details just for a moment, if we can. Does the Fair Labor Standards Act apply at all to, to ministries today? Uh, I know that's a big topic that maybe you can help. I've had that question before and uh, wondering. That's what, simple. I mean, the answer is really simple. It, yes and no. So I don't know if that covers it for you. So it totally <laughs> does. Let's move on. So, <laughs> Seriously, um, you know, the Fair Labor Standards Act um, was obviously implemented to help. Um, and again, I'm 30,000 foot, you know, with overtime, minimum wage, even um, employing minors. Those things are all very, very important. And we have to re recognize that that's a federal law and that our state laws even supersede some of the things that we might read in in um, federal law. So just a couple of quick things on that. Um, even in secular industry, there are those employees that are going to um, be exempt from that um, and those that are non-exempt. And, you know, we may have referred to hourly and salary, but um, it is so important to recognize some people might even think that if they pay someone a salaried level, which is basically twice minimum wage, that they're exempt. And that's not true. There is a balancing test about enterprise level decision making, you know, management of teams. There's other balancing tests that we need to be aware of before we automatically call someone exempt or non-exempt. Um, the, the wage component of an exempt employee really is the last thing in the chain of other decisions that need to be made before we can call them an exempt employee. And then there is a ministerial exemption for those that have sacerdotal functions. And that's very, it's been tested in court actually again, even this year, but those who have sacerdotal function can be exempt even if their, their uh, salary dips below that um, cap of, of twice minimum wage. And that, those are some of the things. And I would just say this, Mark, um, I have much smarter people than, than myself um, that help us in those areas. And I, and I would just say, as you go through this, you need to contact the HR professionals you trust. Um, we use an organization um, called Kingdom One to help uh, give us a lot of examples. We talk to our attorneys. These are organizations that help give us rulings on, on these certain things because corporations actually do have hidden debt. And, and what that's referring to is there are, um, you know, in California, you have four years of statutes of limitations where they can go out and go back and penalize you where you're doing your fifth hour violations incorrectly or your split pre, you know, your um, split shifts and so many things like that. They have four years they can go back on that. Mm -hmm. So it's really important that you even do an HR audit to some degree to make sure that you're um, addressing those things that you may be doing incorrectly. And then hopefully, you know, start ticking off the years of that potential debt that's incurred by the, you know, penalties that you may have for doing those things incorrectly. Well, thanks, George. I know that's a 30,000 foot level. There's a lot deeper in all those laws, both at the federal and state level. I'll just mention one of the things that we've been doing is human resource manual reviews so that HR manuals are actually up to date. That's part of the problem of all the change of laws. And we've got a team of folks that help with some of those things too, if any of our TM churches need it. But, but maybe we can move on to another area. Um, I'm hoping this doesn't happen to Clayton Kershaw tonight is we're going to talk about injuries, but uh, how do you report all injuries, even though, even those, uh, do we report even those that are insignificant or only the big ones or how, how does it, what's a good rule of thumb there, George? Yeah, like one of your pitchers gets a blister on their finger and stuff like that. Yeah, we've seen that recently. So uh, thanks for bringing that up. <laughs> I know that's going to be good. You know, and, and my short answer is, you know, you definitely should be in contact with your workman's comp provider and mm -hmm. potentially your attorney at, at gathering the data necessary for the forms. But I would just say, yes, I would document each and every one of those things. I, I even wrote, uh, I have some notes here from, you know, um, we utilize just at HDC uh, a first notice of injury form so that we can understand who 
who was there, what happened, when it happened. When you're in court later and, and you've been in situations where there was an injury or something like that, it's never, you know, three days after the event. It could be a year later. And mm -hmm. if you don't have those documents on hand, it's really hard to remember who hap what happened, you know, who might have uh, been doing that. And then it's a best practice to complete certain forms that are required. Um, you know, if the injury is first aid only and it's only going to be, a, you know, a few days and it doesn't necessarily have to go on your workman's comp, you know, um, insurance. Um, there are, by the way, some interesting COVID realities to workman's comp insurance right now that our governor has signed into law. So that's why you have to stay on top of those things. But um, I believe that having all those forms in your files are just so incredibly important so that when you go back and you try to figure out what happened, you have a paper trail uh, on those types of things. And, you know, I mean, our goal, if someone gets injured, um, is that we would um, uh, care for our team members. We want them better. That's our highest priority is to love and shepherd and care for our staff. But then also we do protect the church um, legally and our liability by dotting the I's and crossing the T's. And another way to have a very comprehensive, I mean, another reason to have a comprehensive report, Mark, mm -hmm. is um, when you end up having consistent injuries, it's good to have someone review those to find out if there's some sort of training or some way to uh, mitigate some of those accidents. Because you'll find that maybe some of those injuries might have been avoided with maybe a certain level of training or fixing a broken piece of equipment or, you know, so, so those things need to be looked at at a detail level so you can see maybe how to avoid that in the future. Good ideas. Thanks, George, for that. Uh, uh, keeping in mind that we're there for the, for everyone and for the good of the ministry, but mostly for the people that are there and protecting them. So I know I've had some situations where there was a small injury and three years later, you had to try and remember and conjure up well, what happened and what went down. So much better to have some sort of report with you that uh, recorded and documented it. Is there anything in the OSHA uh, requirements that we should know as uh, in, in our ministry that just, again, 30,000 foot level, big stuff uh, that uh, maybe some of our, our pastors and churches would need to know? It's my understanding, I'm not an attorney, but um, you know, it's not, it's my understanding that churches do not have to file the annual OSHA forms, those form 300s and those, those forms that would typically be um, hmm. filed by secular corporations. It's my understanding churches do not have to do that. Um, and so um, again, I would definitely keep track of workplace injuries. And, and when I say that, there, there is a, a weird exemption to that, that you do have to file with OSHA if it's like, a, uh, this sounds crazy, it's like death, dismemberment, and something else where it's pretty significant, loss of an eye or something like that. Mm -hmm. There are very extreme cases where that is actually- Is required uh, still. Be still required, but for the most part, mm -hmm. um, churches yeah. would be exempt from filling out those uh, typical OSHA forms. Well, on another topic, George, uh, what rules apply when hiring youth to perform work for our ministries today? Is there any special rules we should be keeping in mind? Yes, definitely. There are mm -hmm. some definite rules uh, about employing minors. And the biggest thing is making sure that you are retaining the work permits from their schools. And, and you know, that might be uh, another layer of complexity during this COVID reality of trying to get into those school districts and students scattered all over the place. but um, you do have to have signed work permits, uh, releases to hire anyone under the age of 18. There are exceptions um, for emancipated youth and those that have completed their education. But for the most part, you know, you need to have um, in, in your files those, um, uh, the, uh, what am I, I can't, you know, the permits so that you can. Yeah, employ the permits themselves exactly, yeah, for minors. Especially, yeah. yes. Okay. And then there are, you know, you need to be aware of what minors can do and can't do because there are some limitations on, on uh, certain hours of, of uh, labor and, and certain um, things that they might not be able to do. Great, great. George, thank you for uh, your insights today. Uh, I'm glad to hear there's lots of smarter people on your staff, just like ours than me uh, and you. Uh, we need lots of people, and some of those are right here on the screen with us and uh, around the tables with us doing ministry. It's so good to be doing ministry all together and help one another, and I think that's what today's session is about. We want to uh, just have an open discussion now. 
Um, so if you guys want to open up your mics and talk here, um, I'm just going to, these are some general liability questions that maybe, you know, each of us may have run into somewhere and we'll kind of finish with these, but if there are other questions, I haven't seen any on the screen yet, um, we'll, we'll come to those too. Here's the first, first question. Does our ministry need to obtain a special permit before serving or selling food? And I hear this from lots of small churches that do special events or selling food. And this is for Halloween or Harvest Festival or whatever. Uh, how, would, how would you respond to that as a, <laughs> what's the best way to do that? Go ahead, George. <laughs> yeah, I'm, I, so many things, you know, uh, you take a level of common sense, Mark, and what would be reasonable, you know, I always think about if I'm, if I'm standing in a courtroom in front of a jury of my peers, does this sound reasonable? You know, sometimes I yeah. actually give that litmus test. There, you know, for a, for a, a Sunday school class or some group on campus that brings a box of donuts, I think there's a different level of, um, you know, um, responsibility than when you have a coffee shop or, a, or a, a, a place that might serve or hand out food on your campus. So when it comes to those, we, we have a cafe coffee shop on our um, Victorville campus. All of those people we put through, you know, make sure they have their food handlers permit and that we are, you know, basically doing uh, things as you would expect. Um, in a in a Starbucks or something of that nature. So, restaurant. You know, I would I would say that when you've poked your head above the radar, so to speak, and you're running maybe a coffee shop or a cafe, I would definitely um, have all of those people employed there again, have their food handlers permit and all those all those things that would be appropriate and even inspected to make sure that that facility is complying with the health department. Yeah, and I, I would I would simply add to that um, if you're in doubt call your local health department and tell them what you're thinking about doing and whether or not there are special permits needed. And because there, there probably in any jurisdiction, there will be some differences between if you're selling versus uh, just giving. I mean, if you, you know, if it's a low, if it's a Sunday school class and people bring donuts and, and that sort of thing, there isn't an issue, but if you're selling something, that could put it into a whole different category and, and your local health department is probably the best place to at least get some initial read on on what's what would be the right thing to do great yeah i, I remember i was at one church we had three churches on a corner we were all doing a harvest festival i talked to all the pastors said why don't we all work together we closed down the streets in between we thought oh that'd be okay needed a special permit. Oh, we were selling food, need a special permit. Giving away candy at a harvest festival. We're all coming up on that here. Hey, does that doesn't require a special permit because you're giving it away, it's already pre-wrapped because you bought it from somewhere else. But all those considerations, when you do an event, you need to take a look at and uh, comply with local, um, state and federal guidelines. And it's all about safety of people. And so that's why this is under the liability section. So. Uh, I was going to ask Mary some question like, are the assets closest to the window? Or are they closest to the door? Or the assets and liabilities from my uh, class years ago, but we'll go by that one. So how do we protect against liability related to youth and special needs activities? Any ideas from, uh, from any of you on that? Or is there a way to? <clears throat> Let me frame the question a little differently to George. George, do you um, have release forms that you use for youth activities, or do you have forms that uh, uh, provide permission for participation? Yes. Um, typically speaking, it's not. Um, this is all pre-COVID now. There are some different forms that we're leveraging right now uh, during COVID, but um, typically if we're gonna have a minor at, at any length of time outside of what might be the care during a service, um, we look to have um, some, not only release of liability forms, but also um, the ability, you know, those include um, the ability to uh, for medical care, and, and I don't know why the word is escaping, Peter. You know what it is, but uh, allowing us to provide medical care in the in the midst of an accident, 
So we will do have we will have those kinds of forms available. Um, but when it comes to the liability for special events or, you know, youth uh, activities, there there really is from an insurance standpoint what would be normally considered a part of um, church operations. And then there are those things that you know step outside. So if we were taking the entire youth group on a skydiving trip. That would not normally be a part of, of church operations, and that would be a call to our insurance company saying, hey, are you going to cover this skydiving trip, to which they will say no. But um, those are the kinds of things when, it, you know, if it's a miniature golf trip or a day at the beach, those, those are all considered a normal part of church ministry from, the, from your insurance company's perspective. But when, when, man, when you're suspicious going, man, I'm not sure this is... I don't know how our insurance company would um, view this activity, then in order for us to make sure we're protected in those things, we'll make a call and we will make sure that we're covered. And sometimes even some activities require an additional writing um, and can be covered. But that, I don't know if that answers that question, Peter or Mark. Yeah, and, and I, George, I would agree. Probably the most common reason that I called our insurance person was to say, will this youth activity be covered? <laughs> Just because they, you know, youth guys, the youth ministers, part of their job is to come up with stuff that you think, how on earth did they come up with that? <laughs> yes. That's what they come up with. And, um, <clears throat> it, you know, it, it's, it can just create some real challenges. So I, th that is, it, you know, part of part of the answer on many of these questions is call your insurance company first. So true. One, yeah. it's absolutely call your insurance company first. Peter, the yeah. mantra of a student leader is to seek <coughs> forgiveness, not permission. Yeah. And the mantra of people that sit in our seat is we need to seek permission, not yeah. forgiveness. <laughs> you know, I think it goes. And most youth leaders will say, you know, how can we give Peter more gray hair? That's what their job is. Yeah. <laughs> There you go. Or in my case, how can you give me less hair? This is because I was in ministry maybe too long. I don't know. But uh, hey, everyone, thanks for all that. Uh, I, I mean, this isn't an exciting topic, except when we add Clayton Kershaw and the Dodgers in there. Thank you, George. But all of this is things that need to be done in the background so that we can operate safely, effectively, and do kingdom work uh, with our churches. So this is so important. Um, uh, that that we we address these things. So I'm going to give each of you a chance. Uh, maybe Peter, start with you, Mary, George. Any final words you'd like to leave with folks today as we uh, uh, finish up this session? Yeah, um, you know, uh, having spent close to ten years as executive pastor at, at Purpose Church and recognizing that these areas, whether it's security, finance, HR, other legal liability things, mm. it is so easy for those things in those areas to distract from the mission of the church. And that's why I'm willing to volunteer my time to help churches deal with some of those kinds of things. Because if, if we can solve some of those problems before they really become big problems that get you into trouble and become more complex, um, then, then pastors can stay on track and do what pastors ought to be doing rather than dealing with all of this kind of messy stuff. Mm -hmm. uh, and so I just want to encourage pastors, if, if you if you have any questions, don't hesitate to call. Get some answers to them. Don't let things go until it becomes a problem that then becomes really difficult to deal with. Come to us fast and quick, you know, and, and on the church health team, we are attorneys and so forth. But um, that's one of the first things I say to people is I'm not an attorney but I've been around the block enough to know when something's above my pay grade <laughs> and you need to get to an attorney mm -hmm. um, and, you know, and, and we can solve some of these things before they become a distraction to your ministry. Yeah. Keep, 
you know, keep the main thing being the main thing and don't get distracted. And that's, that's to me, that's the most important is the reason uh, why we want to do these, these kinds of things. Great advice, Peter. Thank you. Mary, any, any words from you? Uh, yeah, so because I've spent the last 30 years working as a CPA and a lot of that working with various churches, um, I'm able to see how important it is to have the finances in order. And I know it's not exciting and it's not, not a fun thing, but um, for liability purposes and what we've been talking about, I think it's important that the church does have strong internal controls because when they have that, um, it, it keeps them from creating errors and it keeps them that, uh, that the church can, can go along and people can feel comfortable about giving donations to the church when they know that they have tight financial controls. Yeah. So if uh, any of you out there would like uh, one of these engagements for your church, just let Mark know I've done I've done tens of hundreds, seems like. I have done it for 30 years, so I've done several of them yeah. and um, would be happy to help any church out there. Thanks, Mary. Appreciate your willingness to be part of this and uh, using your gifts in the CPA world to help our churches. I, you bring up a great point. It's about trust. Uh, we should be a trusted resource as a church. And so everything we do, we do it as unto the Lord. But uh, Sometimes if we don't have the expertise, we don't ask. I'm encouraging each of you as pastors, as leaders, ask the question. We'd be glad to help. George, any final words from you? Besides go George, go Clayton Kershaw. I mean, you can add that in. A little nervous about Clayton in the postseason, but I won't go there. Me too. Um, <laughs> the, uh, the, the thing that I would say is what an incredible privilege, uh, even if you sit in the seat of an XP, though that uh, you can create, maintain staff culture and take care of your team. Um, I'm just so blessed to, to be involved in that. And um, Mary's comments about having an audit, you know, um, at HDC, we've, we've had an audit um, for 20 plus years um, because of exactly what Mary's saying. And I could not yeah. agree with her more. Hmm. And now we're beginning to do those things in our HR world because we're recognizing that more and more uh, and I, Mary mentioned that as well in her thing about going through your employees' uh, files and making sure you have the right documentation and stuff. Having some sort of an HR audit, I think it's going to become increasingly important because even if you don't understand new compliance about uh, even your trainings, your sexual harassment, your bullying, you know, the, the various trainings that are required in the state of California for all of your team members now, if you have a, a staff of up by people. And so um, having all that done is so important. And so finding a good team person, like Mary was talking about auditors, you know, finding a good HR partner to come alongside and do those audits for you. I'd mentioned Kingdom One and Alana put that in the chat, but there are other good ones, but we, we lean on them. I would definitely, um, you know, encourage people to start looking at those areas. It can be daunting to start out with, but so can an audit. I remember the first time we ever did an audit, it was like, oh, are we doing anything right? But you know, over the years, you get better and better. And man, when you start getting those unqualified reports and stuff, you're like, wow, you know, that <laughs> finally got there. And I, and I believe it's worth pursuing. Um, so that's what I would, you know, suggest, Mark. Well, thank you, George, Peter, and Mary for lending your expertise today. And to all of our churches over time, you have been such valued experts. I wanna encourage Mark, each of you- The boss had a question. Oh, he did? Uh, yeah, and I, think I didn't it was see that. Was, to me to ignore uh, can churches sell things like books, supplies, et cetera? Okay. Do we want to take that question? I think we should because it's my boss. But yeah, yeah, that's what I was thinking. Yeah. So, yeah. What, what do you guys think before I tell him what I think? <laughs> <laughs> Sounds like this is Mary's area. Yeah. I, oh. I was going to say, you could do it, but you better ask Mary first. Yeah. <laughs> Well, are you regularly and exclusively, not exclusively, but are you regularly doing it? I mean, is this something that you regularly do? Do you have, do you have a bookstore set up? It's kind of like the same thing with, you were talking about the coffee shop. Um, if you regularly are doing that, then you're going to need to collect and pay sales tax. Hmm. There you go. So, so the answer is yes and no, depending on whether 
you're regular or not. That's a whole different topic than probably <laughs> what we intended or maybe what you heard. But hey, I want to say thank you to everyone that's on the screen here. George, Peter, and Mary, thanks for your expertise. Thanks for what you do for church health and for transformation ministries for each of your churches and to support uh, the goal of uh, being all about the Great Commission. How do we help uh, more people, uh, lost people, hear about Jesus? And uh, this is such an important topic today. Uh, for those of you that didn't get some of the resources, we're going to post some of the resources given today in our comments on the website. Uh, there's other webinars coming up in the same place, same time next week. I'll just tell you from children to young adults, growing them, keeping them. We'll have Eric Archer from uh, Friendship Baptist and Amy Hall from Beach Point with us next week. So we'll look forward to seeing you online. Thanks for joining us today. All of this will be recorded. You can take a look at it later in case you want to get another laugh out of a, let's see how the Dodgers do. Um, uh, don't, well, we don't want to yeah, yeah, yeah. cause any problems with bringing that up too many times, but we'll uh, see you online at least next week at one o'clock. Thanks for joining us today. Thanks again to each of you.